Hey, today is Hot Seat Part 4, and we're going to talk about political polarization. All right, it is, uh, I, I've really enjoyed this series because we are really preaching the word to culturally relevant, divisive issues. And it's so important that I preach you the word of God, not my opinion, right? Because I could, I could, t- I could like stick with what's maybe what you want to hear as opposed to what you need to hear or, or what um, tickles your ears <laughs> or, or, you know, instead of the truth of God's word that sometimes can penetrate and hurts. But, but if I did that, what we'd have is a church as an audience, not an army. Okay, and listen to me, you, listen, you cannot win the battle in the war out there with audience level buy-in. You need, you need army level buy-in to fight the forces of evil in heavenly realms that are out there. You need a army level soldier buy-in to win the war against the enemy. How many soldiers of Christ are inside of this room, I wonder? Amen? And I wonder, like... Of those of you that are soldiers for Christ, and we're like, yes, we're soldiers. I wonder who you're fighting, though. I wonder if you're fighting the right battles, the right enemy, if you're fighting on the right battlefield. Uh, Philipp- Let me start here. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says this, our citizenship, for our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. Well, I'm, a, I'm an American citizen. U.S. of A, baby. Uh, listen, I'm not saying that you're not a citizen of wherever you're a citizen of. Most of you are probably citizens of the United States. But Paul is saying that our priority citizenship is of heaven. We are citizens of heaven there now, and we are citizens of heaven then after this life, okay? We belong to heaven. We are ambassadors in this world. And we cannot forget that, church. You cannot get so caught up in the polarized political a uh, uh, contentious season that we are in and forget you do not belong here this is not your home your home is in heaven see not only are you a, a soldier of heaven and a citizen of heaven but you are a son of heaven you are a daughter of heaven you belong to the family of god so here's what he says for our, hey children, listen church we're citizens of heaven from which we also eagerly wait look the savior not the next president Oh my goodness, we, we just, if we just had the next election or the next ballot, oh, just we're waiting, we're waiting for our opportunity to get our guy or our girl or, or our rights or our, that's not what we're waiting for. The Bible says we are citizens of heaven and we are eagerly awaiting King Jesus who comes from there to take us back where we belong. How many of you would agree, though, the world has become more divisive, opinionated? Uh, it really has, and probably over these last couple of years, even more so. And the tension for those of us who follow Jesus today, those of you that don't follow, you still feel the tension. You do, political tension. But the tension for those specifically that follow Christ is this. Are we willing, or, or, or probably more appropriately, are we even able? Are we willing and able to put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? Are we willing to be Christ followers first and Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, and whatever else you call yourself second? Are we willing to follow Jesus? And this is a tough one. Are we willing to follow Jesus when following Jesus creates space between you and your political party? Or how about this? Do you even recognize, can you discern where that space between Jesus and your party is? Can you see it? Do you sense it? Do you acknowledge the space between the will of God and the word of God and the party that you align yourself with? Now, to be very clear, please hear me. I'm not suggesting that you not be political. Okay, I'm not suggesting that you not wade into politics or talk about politics or run for office in any way. I think we need to lean into what's happening in our nation but in some, for some of you, you feel called to that, amen, to step into that fray, amen, if you feel called to that, go for it. But what I am suggesting is that we not allow the political climate to divide the church or to steal our allegiance, okay? There's a, a recent book that was written. I've been showing you different books every week, so I wanted to give you another one. This book was by Andy Stanley. He just released it. If you want to study this a little bit more, this is a great resource, not in it to win it. 
Why choosing sides, sidelines the church? You may want to grab that if you want to study this a little bit further. But I do think that since 2020, since the quarantine, really, around that time, um, the, the world has become more divisive. And if, how many agree with that? Opinionated, divisive since the quarantine, since 2020, right? It probably started before that. Sure, there's always been a divide, but something happened. And not just something happened in the world, but I believe something happened in the church that, that made us think and operate differently during this time. Do you guys, you guys realize that two years ago, like around this time, we were in quarantine. You remember that? Can I take you back there? You remember? I know you like to think about it. But remember quarantine? That was crazy. We all went home and sheltered in place. And, and there was so much uncertainty, a lot of like fear for our loved ones and the world around us and what we're hearing there was just maybe not fear for but definitely uncertainty like what is God doing and what is happening can I tell you something write this down uncertainty doesn't alter our value system it exposes it okay so the political health climate the social the economical crisis of 2020 didn't cause us to misprioritize our values it just simply exposed our misplaced values in the first place. See, the, the, when there's seasons of uncertainty and fear, and it, that actually reveals what's actually been hiding underneath. It's not revealed. Your values aren't revealed when everything's going good and going great, and your candidate's in office, and everything's going fantastic for you. That's not when your values are revealed. It's actually when the pressure gets put on that what is inside of you comes out of you. Let me say it like this. In seasons of uncertainty, we discover what we value most. Sad reality is what was uncovered and unearthed through the uncertainty of this last two years was unchristlike. It was values that did not align with the word of God. Because honestly, if evangelism and discipleship were important to us, we would not have surrendered them so easily to the people that we need to evangelize and disciple. We wouldn't have allowed ourselves to be reduced to a voting block or a constituency or part of the electorate, electorate or pawns. Tragically, because of our misplaced, unchristian value system... We weren't prepared or positioned to take advantage of what was, in hindsight, the greatest opportunity of the church in our lifetime. Because you see, historically, during times of crisis and uncertainty, like we experienced historically, the church has shown the brightest. We came through with love and hope and resources, but something happened. The enemy did something in the people, the church of God, that caused us to fight against each other and to fight the wrong fights instead of fighting the good fight. You see, we argued with our brothers and sisters and our neighbors. We had suspicion about them, and we divided over a quarantine or no quarantine or gathering for worship or not gathering for worship, masks or no masks, race wars and riots, vaccines or no vaccines. Probably at the apex of this illogical division is you, you had believers in Christ that still even believe today that the vaccine is a mark of the beast. I'm still looking for the beast. You know what I mean? Where's the beast at? Where's he at? Where'd he go? If it's... And then on social media, we demonize and criticize by name people we've never met and and. Because of all this, we gave up the moral high ground that Jesus died for, that he gave us as the church. We indiscriminately demonized entire people groups like it was an exercise of virtue. Like, after all, we were standing up for truth, and we will not be intimidated, and we're fighting the good fight. Really? Seriously? Is that what, you, is that what the word of God meant? Was that the good fight? It's your fighting there, that political, that division, divide, divide. Is that the good fight that the word of God calls the good fight in our attempt to save America from the other political party. Well, no, no matter what your political party is, we lost our opportunity to save half the American people. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Y'all with me today? All right, I love you. I love you, but we need to wade into it, okay? We need to wade into this topic. And let me just say, before I even get to this verse, I always say this. I've been saying this almost every week. 
just give me some time to get through this before you push back on me, okay? I promise you, if I hurt your feelings, I'll hurt the person next to you in a minute, all right? Just calm down and, and just give me a little bit of time to, to get through this thing entirely, and then we can prayerfully decide what does God want us to be? How do, we, how do we move forward from the crazy climate as the people of God, okay? So just give me 40 minutes before you push back and check out on me, okay? Amen, everybody? Amen, amen? Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But God has put the body together, giving greater, greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So this is, you wonder why I was saying we and our and stuff like that. It wasn't because when I'm saying we gave up our high ground and all that stuff, it's not because, like, discovery. You guys did really well, by the way. Discovery... You guys did amazing in in these last two years of being the church and being the light and meeting needs and and not being, for the very most part, divisive about some of the battles that people were doing. We kind of, you guys have been great, but when I say we, it's because we are part of the church. Okay, so, because the Bible actually uses that language as well. God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be, look at it, no division that's what god wants no division in the body that but that its parts should have equal concern for each other he goes on if one part suffers every part suffers with it so if you get a sprained ankle the hand doesn't go on social media and criticize your the ankle what an idiot so weak No, if one part suffers, he says we all suffer. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it, he says. Um, Like it or not, there is, and like me or not, (laughs) there is no you and me. There's just we. Write it down like this. There's no room in God's church for you versus me. There is no room for this you versus me mindset. We are all the body of Christ. So this is a we problem. And we need to address it. And the problem I'm referring to is the Achilles heel of the modern evangelical church. And that is political polarization. So let me say it very plainly. Very plainly. Write this down. Saving America is not the position of the church. Saving people is. Come on, can I get an amen, somebody? Okay? So I understand that we need to be concerned about the laws of America. And let's not give up our responsibility to steward our nation and our legislation appropriately. But not at the expense of saving people. And by the way, everyone, like, if this person's in office, the other side wants to save America again. And we need to, and the, let's get it back. Let's take our country back. And then the other person gets in office and is like, no, we need to make it great again and save it again. Everyone is shouting the same thing. But it's not the priority of the church to save America. The priority of the church is to save people. Now, if you're wondering, <laughs> you're wondering, uh, yes, I love my country. Okay, I do. I deeply love my country. I consider myself a patriot. I served in the the navy and i went to war for my country so but when i die i'm not going to washington dc when you die you're not going when our kids die they're not going to washington dc so the problem please hear me the problem is not patriotism it's priority great you're a patriot me too the problem is not our patriotism it's our priority see some christians some christians would rather win an election than win people and we've sacrificed our citizenship of heaven for a lesser citizenship of this earth first corinthians chapter 9 look what paul paul is a fantastic example of how he waded through the the culture of his time which was very divisive very political religious and 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 military and government and new church sprouting how in the world did Paul, you got rome you got you got the religious leaders you got priests you got you got new church how did he do it he kind of explains it to us in first corinthians chapter 9 check this out he says though i am free and belong to no one i have made myself a slave to everyone that's kind of extreme do you just subject yourself like a slave to everyone? To win as many as possible. Here was the priority. To the Jews, look what he said. I became like a Jew so I can win the Jews. 
to those under the law, I became like one who was under the law. Though, look what he says, I myself am not under the law. I'm not under that old Ten Commandments and all these covenants. Like, I'm not under that. I'm redeemed by God's grace. But I did that to win those who were under that law. To those not having the law, I became just like a Gentile, like I didn't operate under the law. Though, he says, I'm not free from God's law, I actually exist in Christ's law, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. We read this passage, check this out, read this passage, and we think like this. I think, if we, in today's terminology, what a coward. What a poser, Paul. You know what I mean? What a pretender. Come on, Paul, choose a position. Choose a side, Paul. You can't stay in the middle. What do you want to do, lose followers, Paul? Come on, take a stand, Paul. What's the matter with you? You can't have it both ways. It's difficult to take a Christ-like stand when you've already taken a political one. I'm going to say that again. It is difficult to take a Christ-like stand when you've already taken a political one. He goes on, he says, I have become all things to all people so that by all means I just might win some of them. See, Paul knew that if I entrench in a side, I'm alienate the people that I was called to save. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. Paul didn't align himself with the temple. He didn't align himself with the empire or the local priesthood. He was willing to stand apart. He was willing to stand alone. And because of that, he was positioned to become the most effective advocate of our faith who has ever lived because he stood in the messy middle for the ecclesia, the church of the living God. Not for a political party, not for an empire, not for a priesthood, a religious sect, but he stood for Jesus and his church. Right in the middle of the mess. I'll become, a, I'll become a Jew if I need to, a Gentile if I need to. I don't care. I'll stand in this place so, I'm, so I can share in the blessing of the gospel and win some. Paul didn't align himself. So the moment, listen, the moment our love or concern takes precedence over the love for the people in our country, we are off mission. We are off mission, you guys. And as a reminder, every time you place your hand over your heart and you do the Pledge of Allegiance, you're talking about this priority I'm advocating today, right? We say, one nation under God. One nation under God. One nation under God. We're, what we're saying, we do a Pledge of Allegiance, we're saying, God takes priority, the nation comes under God. Our ultimate allegiance is to a king who came to reverse the whole order of things. A king who would not require his subjects to die for him. Check this out. But a king who came to die for his subjects. We, came, we, we serve a better king. A greater king. Listen, please, church. It's our uncompromising devotion to this better king, this greater king, that is going to make America a better nation. Him, not your party, him, your uncompromising devotion to King Jesus. Here's what we must understand, though. In order for that to happen, we got to understand this. Disagreement is inevitable. It's going to happen, but division is a choice. That's a choice we got to stop making, church. You got to allow the disagreement to happen, the messy middle to happen, and stop putting the stake in the ground and wedging me against you. There is no me in you. There is just we. And by the way, just because someone considers you their enemy does not mean you have to return the favor. I know this is easier said than done. I get it. I get it. Because, I mean, everywhere we go, social media and everywhere, it's just like we seem to encounter people that are just, they have different you know, core values or beliefs or we just clash with our own. And it's, in fact, one of the reasons why we don't even enter certain spaces or, or enter certain conversations because we know if I, we think at least if I entered it, I just it's going to be an argument. So we'd rather hang around and talk with people and go to places where they think like us, talk like us, and believe like us than have conversations that might be uncomfortable for you. Okay? 
Here, let me explain something very, very central to this message. Christian is not an adjective, meaning there's no such thing as a Christian Republican or a Christian Democrat. Christian, Christianity stands apart from your Republican. From your, you, from your Democratic, uh, you, again, I don't care. You have a, an opinion. Be, ha, be political. Vote. Do it. But Christian is not attached to your politics. It stands apart and above it. Second Timothy chapter 2. Let me give you, this is a very important verse for many of us that we need to take to heart. Here's what he tells the Apostle Paul telling Timothy. He says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Right there, 50% of your posts, gone. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Because you know it's just going to produce a fight. You're just, it's just bait. It's bait. You're taking the bait. You're giving them bait. You're jumping in and doing the quarrel. Well, why is that such a big deal, man? I'm just, that's truth. You know, it's just right. Don't, I want them to know what's right, what's true. Because the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Okay, so, so if you want to be a servant of God, then you cannot be someone who's constantly getting into stupid arguments. Okay? He says this. You must be kind. That's what we should be. We should be kind to everyone, able to teach, and not resentful. So the goal for a child of God, every child of God today, here's, here's the goal. I might hold what I desire out of this message. And I just got some truth I want to share with you. I want to kind of point out some things, but I got probably two application steps, though, really just two steps for you to take today. But here's my goal. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 explains the goal. I hope for every single one of you. I've been praying for you. I hope we can say this about ourselves. He says, this is our boast. And our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world. The way that we conducted ourselves in the world when I was in my job, when I was... In the marketplace, when I was hanging out, when I was at home, I could, the way we conducted ourselves in the world, and especially in our relationship with you, with integrity and godly sincerity, how do we do that? Look what he says. We've done so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. That's what I want us to be able to say when this contentious, toxic season is over. It may never be over. I don't know. But what I want us to be able to say is that you were guided by God's grace and not the wisdom that comes from this world. And what we desperately need at church is to hear from God. We need to hear from Him, not another commentator, not another news station, not another pep rally. We need to hear from God. You know, you're going to base your values, your decisions, your choices either on the Word of God or the world. Those two things are diametrically opposed from each other. So here's what I want to do in our next few minutes together. I just want to show you kind of the, the lie of the world, like to contrast what the world says and the word says. What politics say and what Jesus say. Because I have a sinking feeling that there might be some of you that don't know where that line is of what your politics are and what Jesus says. And we need to know the line, church. We need to know and be able to contrast what they're selling us and what his word says. And then, and then after we do that, I'm just going to give you a couple application steps, all right? So I, and I could have given you a lot of contrast here, but I'm just going to give you several. Okay, write these down. Here's the first one. Number one, here's the lie. Politics are trying to sell us that politics are the driving force in everything. And that's what the world says. Like, people talk about politics as if it's the most important thing in the world. And for a lot of people, it is the most important thing in the world. For people who don't know God and don't depend on God as their highest power, their highest power becomes government. Because what is the highest? Because if I don't have God, then the highest power is those who are in authority, who have power and have control. It's the government. For secular people, politics is the way you get things done. By the way, everything is political now. Everything has been politicized. And even as a pastor, more and more, Sadly, more and more, the people that come up to me that want to ask me questions, they're not asking me questions about the kingdom of heaven. They're asking me questions about politics. Pastor, what do you, what do you think about this? 
What do you believe about this? What do you say about this? Such a sad reality of the nature of our minds and where we are living and where we are focused on that we're not wanting to learn and feed from the truth of the word of God, but we are so concerned with what's happening in this world and not concerned with the word of God. What does the word say, though? How does it contrast with politics and the lie? Here's the truth. Jesus says that his church matters more than anything else. Politics aren't the most important thing on this planet. Jesus' church is. It's the only thing that's going to last. Politicians, politicians, they flip their priorities based on what's popular or based on the political, what their political party is aligned with in that season. But the word of God never changed. It stays the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Politics change. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 about his church, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the, all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Jesus didn't say, I will build my nation. Jesus didn't say, I will build my ministry. I will build my business or my organization. He said, I will build my church. It's the only thing that is going to make it into eternity. God's church. Let me show you a few verses that show the importance of the church. That it's actually not politics. It's God's church. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 says this. That God's intent was that now, meaning like, like now in this age that we're living in, through the church... <laughs> The manifold wisdom of God should be made known. The church is actually the way that people know God. It is through the church that the wisdom of God, the will of God, would be made known through God's called out people, the ecclesia, the, the church of God. Look at how much Jesus loved the church. Ephesians chapter 5. Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her you want to see how much jesus or god loves the church look no further than the cross he gave his life for the church to present her to himself as a radiant church you can't read the new testament without seeing how much god loves his church you know why because it's his family it's his children it's it's us and if we're going to be effective for Jesus in our generation, then we have to learn how to love God's church the, the way he loves it. We have to. You know what's sad today? A lot of people use the church, but they don't love the church. A lot of people use the church. We enjoy it. We benefit from it. But we don't love it. If you're going to be a strong disciple of Jesus, strong follower of Jesus. you got to learn to love the church the way Jesus loved the church. I love the way the message puts this next verse, Ephesians chapter 1. In this paraphrased version, it says this, the church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. Okay? It's a change in paradigm. Like God's church is the only reason why this world is still here. Do you see that? It's not like we're just here in this earth and the world is, is, is like all around us. No, no, no. The, the, the world is peripheral to the church. The moment that this church is gone, when Jesus says, it's time, come on home. I'm taking you to where you belong. You're a citizen of heaven. It's time to go back home. The moment that God takes his church and raptures us home is the moment this place, this world, goes to hell in a handbasket. It's over. Why? Because the church is holding it together. It's the glory of God. The spirit of God, the power of God, the presence of God, the manifold wisdom of God existing on this earth through the people of God, the church of God, that's actually holding this whole world together. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. Man, you just, you got to fall in love with it. That's a lie of the enemy. Politics ain't everything. It ain't everything. This church is. Okay, some of you are in your you're so involved in politics that you can't get involved in church. And you, follow, you fell for the lie of the enemy. Okay? Second lie. Are y'all with me today? Y'all with me? All right? Okay, second lie. Here we go. Number two. Your political party um, can solve all your problems and save the world. Which seems silly, right? We read it. We say that. We're like, that's silly. But that's what they're saying. That's what they sell us. 
Every time they do, they're like, it's over. It's going over. Unless you vote. <laughs> unless, unless, we, unless we take over. Unless we come back. <laughs> unless we take it. It's, that's the lie. We're going to make the world better again. We're gonna, and they say that for every. When Trump was in office, this person, they said it. We're going to take back America. Now Biden's in office, and they're like, we got to get it back. Everyone is saying the same thing. Every politician, they make the same promise every election. And by the way, every politician will say, this is the most important election. You know why? Because they're running in it. <laughs> the problem is, you guys, when you hear stuff over and over and over and over and over and over, all the lie, the lie, solve your problems, save it, solve it, solve it, it's a problem. Look at, we can, we can do something, we can do something about it, we need changes, we need changes. We hear it over and over and over. You know what happens? You begin to believe it. You believe it. You bought into it. It's infiltrated our citizenship. No human is our savior. No human, no political party can save. So what is the truth then? The truth is this. Only Jesus can save you and solve your worst problems. We know this. Every social problem on planet Earth is actually a spiritual problem. It is. It's just been turned into a social issue. It starts in the heart. Jesus told us that murder, adultery, jealousy, greed, all these things that cause crime, breakdown in families, wars, all that stuff, it's a spiritual problem. It begins in the heart. It's just been turned into social Ill issues of our day by politicians. Okay, Psalm 146, verse 3. Look what it says. Do not put your trust in princes. Who were the, like in that time, that was the governing officials. So this could be said to do not put your trust in senators. Presidents, you know, officials, do not put your trust in princes. They're just mere mortal men. They cannot save you. They're not your savior. Now, is it, again, I'm not saying don't get involved, don't vote. Please do. I have some opinions about it, too. And I'm getting myself informed and trying to align with how I vote and what I do with the word of God. And, but, but they can't save you. They're not. In fact, Jeremiah 17 and 5 says this. And I think some of this is happening. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans. That we're under a curse when we rely on our human strength and our hearts begin to shift, like our devotion and our focus and the energy is expense. And I've seen so people that start off on fire for Jesus just get pulled into the debate, pulled into the side, and their anointing is lost. Their anointing gets forfeit. Their hearts away from the Lord. The Bible says that's you're going to be under a curse. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Now look, if you spent as much time talking about God's word as you did politics, you'd actually start maybe looking like a servant of the king instead of a servant of a candidate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> number three, number three. And this, is, I didn't, this isn't even a lie. This is just the world system. This is a, I didn't call this one a lie because it is the truth. It's just the world system. Here is the world system that we live in, the political polarization, our political climate. Votes and money come by creating division and fear. Do you know that? Every politician knows this. This is a reality. This is what they, what they use. Nothing divides like politics because nothing divides like fear. Attack ads are going to be more successful at raising money than positive ads. Like, if I got a flyer in the mail that said all the great stuff this candidate has done and is going to do, it's a lot less effective than getting a flyer in the mail that says all the bad stuff their opponent did. That is just the reality of politics. It's, our, it's built on, the system we have is built on politics to create division, to wedge people against each other or against their opponent. Even the way that we get our news, the way that we get our news, you understand, right, that it just reinforces our political bias. They're all using the same tactic, division and fear, division and fear. You understand the media does not want to inform you anymore, right? I hope you do. You need to understand. Listen, I don't care what news station. The media does not want to inform you anymore. They want to influence your opinion, okay? All right? They're not, they're not out to inform. They want to influence you. Division sells. But what does Jesus say? Here's what Jesus says. In my church, unity gets priority over politics. 
Politics have no place in the church. When you bring in politics, you divide God's church. And, and we already were told that the, we are one body. And the reason when one suffers, both of us suffer, when one is honored, everyone's honored, there is no division. We don't do that. So here at Discovery, we don't bring politics in. Do we bring truth? Am I going to talk about difficult things? Absolutely. But I'm not going to be a political pundit from this stage. I am a pastor, not a politician. Now, I get the other churches, and I know, I know other pastors, they may do it different. They feel like it's the right thing. They're going to take a stand. Take a stand. And, and they vote this way. And this is the way. A, these people, look at, all these, look at all these Democrats. Look at all these Republicans. Look at all these liberals. Look at all these conservatives. And they're just like, and it's, and, and I get what you're saying. And I get like, like you want to help people be informed. But politics do not belong in the body of Christ because it creates division in the moment that you do not operate like Paul in the messy middle and you start to take a political stand and instead of a Jesus stand you will alienate the people we're trying to save so do I have an opinion absolutely absolutely but I serve a greater king and I'm a citizen of a greater kingdom and I'm going to use my voice and my influence to for the, the sake of God's gospel, not for the sake of a political candidate. Come on, somebody, amen? I know some of you disagree. I don't care. Because I ain't going to do it. I'm just not. Because I love you, that's why. Listen to me. I love you, not because you're a Republican. Or a Democrat, or a liberal, or a conservative. I love you because we are God's church. Okay? We're one. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Look, I'm just going to give you some, some verses about division in the church and how important. He says, Make every effort to keep yourselves um, informed. No. Make every effort to, uh, to make sure you vote the right way, that people know. What the truth is, no, no, no. Make every effort to, to keep the unity, to be united in spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Well, let me say it like this. You need to write this down. Never, 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 never burn a relational bridge over a political view. Never do it. It's not worth it. It's not. Uh, stop, stop cutting people off because of what they believe. Let me give you a few more verses, and then I, I, I got a few more things, and I promise we'll, we'll close in 20 minutes. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. First Corinthians chapter 10. Let me off. <laughs> I beg you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, not to argue among yourselves. Come on, we got to be better, church. It's a we problem. We gotta, let's lead the way. Let's be better. Let, don't argue among yourselves. Let there be real harmony so there won't be divisions in the church. He says, I plead with you. Here's the unity. Let's have the same mind, thought and purpose. So what is it? Is it, it's, it's the thought and purpose of the kingdom? Not to be united, and some people take it. See, we got to be united in thought and mind. This is the way. Vote oh, like this. Because we've got to be united in thought. No, 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 no. That's not what it's talking about. I'm sorry. We need to be united in thought and purpose to God's kingdom, not to the political kingdom of this world. Romans chapter 14, 1. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. What do you mean? Don't see the way I do. They're wrong. No, they're. God's giving room for diversity of, of belief and in, in even value, not kingdom, not Jesus, but some people aren't going to see things the way you do, and that's okay. He says, no, welcome them. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Come on, somebody needs to write this down, put it somewhere, <laughs> memorize this thing, put it everywhere in your life. Okay, let me show you... Um, before I give you the two application steps, I'm going to give you two challenging application steps. I want to show you Jesus' prayer. Right before Jesus was going to be crucified, he, he said a prayer that the disciples wrote down that a lot of people don't realize how important it was. These are Jesus like, 
This was his prayer. God the Father, help me. Because this thing is not going to last. This church, at the gates of hell won't prevail. Meaning Rome's not going to take it. No country's going to take it. No, no movement's going to take it. This thing's going to... It's not going to last if you don't answer my prayer, God. Look what Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 1. Father, my hour has come. I'm getting to the end of my life. Glorify your son so that you may glorify you. And then verse 11, he says, I will re remain in the world no longer, but they will still be in the world. He's talking about his disciples. And I'm coming to you, so Holy Father, protect them. Like This is his heart. Like This is like I'm leaving, and we need to protect this thing we started this good new salvation for all mankind. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. And here's why I want you to protect them. Here's why I'm praying this prayer. So that they may be one as we are one. Jesus knew that the power in this gospel and in this mission was in the united force of his people. And that the only way that we would be conquered is if we would be divided. He says, my prayer, my prayer is not just for them alone, meaning his disciples. But I pray for those who are going to believe because of their message, meaning all of us who would follow because of what was written and spoke about and the message that they had in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Now, all of us, Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you, may they also be in us. And this is so cool. All this is so that. That's so that. That's the clause. Protect them. Help them to be one. Help them that they're going to reach, that, that we would stay united and be one. And it wasn't even just for us. He said, it, it's for them. It's for the world. That the way that we love each other, the way that we embrace each other, the way the church of God should be the most diverse place on the planet. It should be the place where, where all people of all race and ethnicity and culture and country and creed and background and values should be able to come politi political persuasion should be able to come together under the banner of Jesus and exalt the king of kings together we should be the most diverse people group and he says if we can do it if we can keep them one and not let Rome divide them our politics our people if they can be one then the world would know that you sent me the world would know they believe that you sent me and I've given them, look what he says, and I'm going to give them my glory. What's in me? This power you put in me, God, I'm going to give it to them. And this power, this glory, so that they may be one as we are one. He even attaches the glory of the Spirit of God that is in me. Listen. What's in me is in you, and what's in me is in you, and what's in you is in him, and what's in her is in her, and what's and, and this is the uniting spirit that connects the body of God. And he says, It's I in you, you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then, here it is again, then the world will know that you sent me. And I have loved them, even as you have loved me. So two things, two challenges I want to give you really quickly. First, I'm going to ask you and challenge you to pray like Jesus prayed. Because most of us have never prayed this. Because maybe we don't want this. But maybe you need to start praying it until you want it, okay? So here's the first thing. I want you to pray, church, pray for oneness. Pray for unity in the body of Christ. That, that the spirit of God would keep us completely united. That, no, that politics wouldn't divide us. That there'd be room for disagreements without division. Pray, pray for oneness. And then secondly, secondly, I want you to look for an opportunity. Because you're going to have to look for it. Okay, Look for an opportunity to love unconditionally. You don't like the way God loves you. Without condition. To love unconditionally someone with whom you disagree politically. Hmm. You're like, well, I don't even know anyone personally that I disagree politically. Yeah, that's a problem, okay? That right there should get you started. Listen, that right there is why you haven't learned anything in 15 years probably. Ooh. That's why you're so convinced that you're right. 
you are so give me back you're like i can't i can't understand have you ever heard that have you ever said that i can't understand how people could believe that how are they so why how i don't understand how people you just made a confession there's something listen you don't understand i can't understand how people would behave that way you just made a confession there's something you don't know because possibly you don't have anybody in your life or invited into dialogue with you to share with you why you don't know what you don't know i know what some of you are thinking sorry for going long today i love you you're 11 30 though so well this is what happens when you come to this service and the service at the end of this one so here's what some of you are thinking you're thinking well, that's a cool sermon, but you're the pastor. You're supposed to say stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, but really, pastor, do you really think that this is possible? Like, isn't it a little naive to think that this is actually possible, that we could somehow coexist with the vehement disagreements that we have? No, probably not vehement, yeah because you're so attached to the kingdom of this world and not the kingdom of heaven. True, I get it. But yes, I do. Absolutely, I believe. You know what's naive? Let me tell you what's naive. What's naive is a first century rabbi <laughs> removed from the epicenter of all the action of his day. <laughs> he, he gets 12 guys who are younger than him who know nothing. They're uneducated, unschooled. They have no political clout. They have no training. And he gets these guys and he tells them, I'm going to build my church gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it with you. Now that's naive. And they, they look at him and go, us? What the? We're nobody. We're going to be a part of this thing. You're going to... And he goes, yep. And not Rome, not the temple, not the political... Not, nobody is going to be able to stop this thing. Now that is naive. But he did it. Nothing stopped him. And we're a part of it. So, so disagree politically love unconditionally and pray for oneness disagree politically okay make room make room make room disagree politically love unconditionally and pray for oneness disagree politically love unconditionally pray for unity come on let me pray for you all